Have you ever wondered what it'd be like to respond to an in-flight a medical emergency on a plane? Have you wondered how you would respond if you would jump up or if you would hang back and let somebody else take control? Or if you did answer the call, would you know what to do? Or would you kind of panic and forget all of your training? Well, I have been put to the test. It happened on a flight I was on recently and I want to tell you all about it. Before I jump in though, I just want to ask one quick favor. I'm trying to grow this channel and I would love for you to subscribe. It doesn't cost you anything. And I'm really trying to hit 500 subscribers by my birthday on June 17th. So help me out, please. Okay, now let's hear the story. I was returning uh, on a very long flight and from a great vacation and I had just finished my third movie and I was looking at watching a fourth and I realized there wasn't quite time. There's only a little over an hour left in the flight. That dreaded announcement came Ladies and gentlemen, have your that there was a passenger in need of medical assistance and for medical personnel to identify themselves to the flight attendant. So my moment had come and I sat there thinking, oh my God, this is really happening. And then I had that little internal dialogue and I sat there for not very long. And then I just kind of leaned over into the aisle, see if I could figure out what was happening. And I saw that there was probably about four or five women standing around that looked like they had responded, but it didn't really look like anyone was taking control or doing anything yet with the passenger. So I decided to get up just to make sure there was somebody who was a provider or someone, you know, with more qualifications than me to take care of the situation. So when I got up there, it turns out that I think that they had all identified that they were nurses and I had identified myself as a PA. And it was, it was kind of strange because there wasn't a whole lot of conversation, just some then, you know, kind of filtered back to their seats and there was me and one other nurse left. And so I started taking care of the patient and the nurse got the medical kit from the flight attendant and started taking the vitals. But before I continue telling you the story, I wanted to talk a little bit about responding to in-flight emergencies, that your obligations and the liability of it. I looked this stuff up obviously after I came home. I was wondering how often it happens and there was a 2018 JAMA article that said that it's usually about one in every like 600 flights there is some kind of medical emergency that needs people to respond to. If you fly at least somewhat regularly, it's a good chance that you're going to be in this situation one day. So it's interesting, in the United States, Canada, the, the UK, and I think Singapore, there is no legal obligation to respond just because you've been medically trained. But there are some countries like Australia and many of the European countries that there's actually laws that require you if you have medical training, well, at least it says physicians, so I assume that that would apply to other people who have medical training, that you are obligated to respond. And if you're on an international flight from one of those countries, like to the US, the law that governs that would be dictated by where the airplane company is located. So if the company is headquartered in Australia, but you're flying to the US, you would be under Australia's law obligated to render aid. Let's talk about the liability side of it. The 1998 Aviation Medical Assistance Act says that legal action can't be brought against you unless you performed gross negligence or willful misconduct. And gross negligence, the article said, is a little different than just ordinary negligence. For instance, if you're giving CPR to somebody and you were told from, by somebody else that that person is a, a convict or a drug dealer or something like that, and you decide to stop giving the medical aid because you don't you know, think that person deserves your help. That would be an example of like gross negligence. But from what I understand that article, that you know, making a, just a genuine mistake or missing something is not considered gross negligence. And also in the sources that I looked at, there's never been a reported case of a physician being sued over rendering aid in a, in a commercial aircraft. So I think that the liability issue is, is fairly small and probably not something that you have to think about too much. So let's get back to the story. It's gonna be vague because we have to protect the patient's privacy, obviously. My great fear was that when I responded to the emergency that it was going to be a very 
complicated patient that has several comorbidities and has a laundry list of medications, and they're either going to have some vague but very concerning complaints, or it's going to be an imminent life-threatening situation. Thankfully, that was not the case. The passenger was fairly healthy adult, and they were not on any kind of medications. And the situation was fairly straightforward. They were pale, their vitals were a little concerning, and there was evidence that they had some kind of internal bleeding. So obviously a serious situation, but it wasn't like I had to be down there giving CPR for somebody. So I'm very thankful for that. So the flight attendant did relay back to us that the captain was in touch with Ground Medical and they had authorized us to start an IV if we felt it was in the patient's you know, best interest. A few minutes later, the flight attendant told me that the captain wanted to speak to me. This is your captain speaking. Which, you know, kind of makes you a little a little nervous or excited, nervous excitement, I guess. And the captain was asking me about the situation. I gave him kind of a brief overview of what was happening. And then he asked me that dreaded question, do you think that we need to divert the plane and land at a closer airport? And, you know, I had that, that imposter syndrome kicks in and I'm, I'm looking around and I'm like, I, I, who am I? You know, I didn't say this, but in my brain, I'm screaming, who am I to make this decision? I had heard somewhere before that diverting an airplane and landing somewhere else can cost like up to three quarters of a million dollars. And I was panicking just a little bit thinking, you know, oh my God, I have to make this decision. But I, I calmed down a little bit and, and I conferred with a nurse for a few moments and we were both kind of in, agree in agreement that we felt the patient was stable enough and thankfully, we were not that far from the destination airport by this time. So I told the captain that I you know, felt the patient was stable enough, but that we did need to have emergency personnel meet the plane and take them to the hospital to be checked out. And he said, oh, yes, that's already, you know, that's going to going to happen. And we will, we've already been given direct flight clearance to land. And there's, they've been given priority taxi so that once the plane lands, we can get to the gate very quickly. So we landed. The paramedics did take quite a while to board the airplane. Um, but when they finally did, I was wondering, well, how are they going to get the patient off the plane? Because the patient had told me that they didn't know if they were steady enough to walk. So they end up wheeling down this little kind of, you know, really thin miniature wheelchair. And they put the passenger on that. And, and took them out, obviously, after they got report, you know, from us and what was going on. And I was surprised that nobody asked me at the end to sign anything or fill out any reports. The paramedics didn't even ask my name or anything. They just took report and, and went on. And let's talk about the emergency kit that's on board. I did find out later that the FAA requires uh, very specific things in an emergency kit. It's pretty basic and bare bones. There is a stethoscope. It's one of those very cheap ones that's hard to hear out of, even harder to hear when you're in an airplane with those big engines droning on. It was pretty much useless. And um, they have to have a blood pressure cuff. The ones that this airline had was a, a wrist cuff. And with that useless stethoscope, that was probably better to have than an actual manual blood pressure cuff. They're also required to have an AED on board, at least one, a CPR mask, IV saline, and the needles and, and tubing that goes with that, gloves and gauze and tape and scissors, those kind of basic things. They have to have some type of oropharyngeal airway and manual resuscitation devices. For medications, they have to have non-opioid analgesics, aspirin, injectable antihistamines, and atropine and an inhaled bronchodilator. They have to have nitroglycerin tablets and also injectable epinephrine, dextrose, and lidocaine. I did watch a Dr. Mike video where he answered the call on an airplane and he said he was surprised that they had epinephrine in a vial, but they did not have EpiPens. As you can imagine, it can be quite difficult in an emergency situation with somebody's throat closing if you're not familiar with the dosing on Epi to have to draw up just the right dose, it's much easier to use an EpiPen. But EpiPens are very expensive, and especially if you're trying to kit out a whole airline fleet. And, you know, I guess if you have the, the Epi that you drop from a vial, you can use it for other instances. So just be aware of that, that you're probably not going to have an EpiPen and that you're going to have a very kind of bare bones kit that you're going to have to work with. I do hope that if I'm ever in that situation again, that I would take a little bit more time or whoever is kind of in charge would take more time 
to really kind of ascertain what the different credentials are of the people that are responding. I didn't ask everybody specifically what their nursing specialty was because, you know, there's a, a big difference between a school nurse and like a critical care ICU nurse. And I also think that it would have been nice if I would have asked for some paper and a, and a pen to be able to, to make a soap note so that your brain, you know, gets prompted to ask the next thing and to go in a logical order to help you not forget things. Thankfully, this was a fairly straightforward situation. And then later, I second-guessed myself about the physical exam, like maybe I should have laid the patient down. I did kind of a seated abdominal exam. But you can't underestimate how disorienting it is to be on a full airplane and having to render aid. There wasn't any like empty rows around me where the patient could easily lay down. And, you know, you don't really want to put somebody on an airplane floor unless it's an absolute emergency where you have to give CPR or something. So I, I think that what I did was correct. And then I did find out later that question about um, diverting the aircraft. So it is totally the captain's responsibility. They are getting the information from you. They're getting the information from the flight attendants. And they are also talking to ground control and ground medical. And they are factoring in a whole bunch of things to make that decision whether to divert or not. And I found out it's a little bit more complicated than just inconvenience and cost. There's a lot of things that the captains have to consider because they have to consider the safety of the whole aircraft. And, you know, it depends on how much fuel they have, how heavy the plane is, how long the runways are on the air airports around. So just be aware, even if you're telling the captain you think that the plane needs to land right now, the decision is ultimately the captain's and you have no, you are not responsible for what that captain ultimately decides. And after I was home for a few days, um, I was surprised that I got an email from the airline. It was a very nice email thanking me for stepping up and offering care. And they told me that they were going to put some bonus miles into my frequent flyer account and that they knew I was responding out of my sense of duty and to help somebody else, not for reward or compensation. So I was a little concerned about this. I was wondering, does these accepting these miles into my account, will that mean that I open myself up to some more liability? So when I was reading about that, the act does say that you cannot accept monetary compensation and you cannot send a bill for your services. But the articles I read generally said that bonus mileage or seat upgrades does not really fall under the category of monetary compensation. Of course, to be on the safe side, it's best not to receive anything. However, the email didn't really give me a choice. It just said they were putting the miles into my account. So that was kind of strange. I didn't really have the option of rejecting them or not. I mean, I suppose I could get in touch with the airline and ask them to take them back out of my account. But overall, I feel this was a pretty low risk situation and, you know, I'm, I'm happy to receive the miles. So I think at this point, unless somebody tells me different down below, that I will just let it be. So I'm curious to hear from you out there. Have you ever responded to an in-flight emergency and what was your experience? Do you have any thoughts on accepting the airline miles or, you know, were, were you offered anything if you did respond? And if you haven't responded yet, what do you think your response would be? Let me know down below in the comment section. Thanks for joining me today. Don't forget to subscribe. Help me get that birthday present. If you want to see videos of PAs and NPs out there doing cool and unusual jobs, then check these videos here or go to my main channel page.